Today's and tomorrow's uh, sessions are going to be a bit different than the previous ones. So what we've done for the last two days is develop a theoretical system, right? So there's not been a great deal in the way of complicated empirical data or empirical generalizations. Rather, what we've been focusing on is solving a theoretical problem about labeling, developing a system that allows us to solve that problem, and then exploring some of the theoretical consequences of that system. There were two important theoretical consequences of the system that we finished up with. One was that actually within this system, it turns out that there's no kind of real notion of what you might call theta domain for argument licensing, right? So do you remember that we, we, we had roots of various sorts? And then above, there's no way that the roots can, this is a very good, there's no way that the root can merge directly with some kind of a complement. Right? So that's ruled out in this system. Do you remember? Because the labeling algorithm. Instead, what we have to have is something where the root projects up to some kind of structure or other. And then, if you want to add some another, another phrase to this, right? then what we need to do is include some other functional structure which builds in that phrase. Okay? So rather than, for example, having you know, V. Right, taking like the root verb, like, kiss, which is the verb, taking a DP complement, what we have to do is we have to say that kiss to the root projects up to V, then there's some other functional structure which I call O, which then has the DP complement in its step. So you don't get a local domain for the life for the for argument licensing, right? Because this is not local. Obviously, this is not local to this. It's not sister or anything like that. So that's that's the that's what I'm going to explore today, right? Because actually, that seems that's pretty un. I mean, it's not very normal, right? We but we always kind of normally think, aha, the lexical element has got theta rolls attached to it, and those theta rolls get discharged really quickly by local syntactic uh, operations, right? So there's a theta domain which sort of surrounds the root, is the classic view. So in my system, uh, I can't do that, right? So my system forces me to say that actually theta roles are assigned really by functional categories, right? Functional categories which are part of the extended projection of the root, of the verbal root. Um, so that doesn't look true, uh, or at least, I mean, it doesn't look that uh, within the domain of verbs that that's necessary, right? It's compatible with what we know about how verbs work. And in fact, as you all know, there's been an enormous amount of work in the last 10 years or so which has empir empirically argued that certainly subjects are introduced by functional categories, that's little d, and objects probably as well, oh, indirect objects being introduced by functional categories, so that's the Morantz, Pilkin, and applicative heads. Everyone aware of those? Yeah? So afflicted heads. And then, obviously, some people have also argued, so Ramchand and Barrer, especially, have also, and more recently, uh, Bowers in his LI monograph, have been arguing that actually objects are also licensed by functional categories. So, you know, actually, all of the empirical work that's been done, or a lot of the empirical work that's been done over the last few years, leads us to a picture that looks like my picture, rather than a picture that looks like the traditional picture, right? But uh, it still keeps everything pretty close to the root, right? That is, what you have is a, ver is, is a root, with a verb in it, a kiss. And then you've got a bunch of functional categories which are licensing the specifiers. So they're pretty close. But notice my theory doesn't force that closeness, right? It doesn't force the closeness. It allows it, but it doesn't force it. So if we had a... Uh, um, another domain of argument structure where actually we could see that the argument is introduced pretty far away from the root, that's allowed by my theory, but not allowed in the standard model. Right? In the standard model, arguments are very close to the roots. Right? My theory allows them to be close or be further away. So my theory is, in a sense, looser than the standard model. 
right? Um, so what I'm going to show you today is, uh, if you look at relational nominals, um, we'll see that there's, actually this is not just today, today and tomorrow, we'll see there's evidence that in relational nominals, the apparent argument of the relational nominal is actually structurally extremely distant from the, from the head, from the root. Okay? So that's where we're going today. Um, oh, that was one theoretical claim. I mean, the other theoretical claim that emerged in the system was the lack of uh, non-local non beta assignment. Possible? And then the second one was no roll-up, right? So in terms of no roll-up, we probably won't get to that today. We'll probably get to that tomorrow, I guess. Uh, but we'll see some of the empirical consequences of the theory actually ruling out roll-up analyses as well. We might see a bit of that today. Okay, so the domain that I'm going to be interested in for the rest of the sessions that I'm going to talk about are relational nominals. And by relational nominals, I'm really going to focus on what Doughty and Barker in their 1990-something paper called ultra-nominal nominals, right? So ultra-nominal relational nominals are those nominals that are not verbal relational nominals, right? So we can think of a verbal relational nominal like destruction, right, or analysis. Any of those things are derived from verbs, okay? They clearly have arguments, right? David's analysis of the structure, okay? Um, so they, they're relational because they have arguments, right? But I'm not going to focus on those today. I might say a little bit about them at the end. What I'm going to focus on is these ultra-nominal ones. So these are things like picture, classical picture nouns, right? The picture of David, right? Where of David seems to be an argument picture in as much as if you have a picture, it's a picture of something, and the of something identifies what it's a picture of. Or nouns like edge, right? So if we say, if we say, this is the edge, but well, it's the edge of the whiteboard, okay? And normally we take that to be uh, an argument. So a whiteboard would be an argument of edge, right? Or king, king of England, we would take of England to be an argument of king, and so on. None of these are derived from verbs, but they're all classically relational nominals. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Mostly English today, and then mostly other languages well, mostly English in this first hour, mostly other languages afterwards. Okay, so um, let's uh, go through a quick history lesson first of all. I always like my history lessons. Um, so the first thing to think about uh, is where, where standard theory takes us right now with respect to relational nominals. And the standard view of relational nominals is that they are something like what we saw the standard view of verbs was. Right? That is, we have a noun and it's got a PP complement, right? So we have something like edge of the table. So this is like linguistics 101, right? You know, you, 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 get, you dig out your Radford and you say, okay, well, student of physics versus student in the corridor, and we show that student of physics is a constituent to the exclusion of in the corridor, and that of physics in the corridor is not constituent, and from that, we gather that the construction, the constituency structure is edge of the table and then some other stuff, right? By the pens, right? So that's the linguistics 101. It tells us this, we've got the structure. Why do we tell our students this? Or why are we going to tell our students this in the future? Um, well, it's because of remarks and normalization, okay? So before remarks and normalization, who's read remarks and normalization? Yeah. Who's, who's not read the Marx and Normalization? <laughs> Deary me, I can't tell whether you've read it or not. Okay. For those of you that have not read the Marx and Normalization, students are looking at you, I would suggest you go and read it 23 times. Okay? Because I think I've read it about 50 odd times, and every time I read it, I find something new and interesting. It's an amazing thing. All right, and actually it's a paper that set an enormous amount of the agenda for the development of syntactic theory since the 70s. I mean, it's really the, the paper that broke off, for example, HPS and LFG from transformational grammar. It was really important doing that. It's, a, it's the paper that 
you know, if you look at all the textbooks you've got, basically most of the proposals in those textbooks on not noun phrase structures in there and on phrase structure in general. Is in there. So, and um, what Chomsky said, which is not what people often remember, is the following. What Chomsky said is uh, that nominalizations like decision, right, and they're non-nominalized forms like decide, are not related by transformational syntactic rule. So before remarks on normalization, people would take decision to be derived from something like, you know, thing that is decided. Right? Now this is, this is becoming very, very cool and trendy again. So actually there's been a bunch of papers in the last, you know, three years where people have taken, actually not just normalizations, but all nominals really to derive from underlying relative clauses. So Kane is the most obvious person that does that. But way back before remarks on normalization, that was the standard view. The standard view was that nominalizations, especially, were just essentially derived from verbs, right? And then some transformations turned those verbs into nouns in the syntax. Okay? What remarks on normalization did they say, no, 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 that's not true. And John gave a bunch of arguments to do with productivity and so on that I'm not going to talk about here. But what he said instead was, Actually, there's a root, this is in 1970, right? He said there's a root which is a-categorial, has no category in it, in the lexicon. So the root I'll give you there in two decade, right? Which is, doesn't have a category feature, but has a selectional feature, subcategory feature, saying I want to occur with a sentence, right? Very old stuff, right? So what this says is this root decade, is going to occur, it doesn't have any category in it, but it's going to occur before an S, right? So if we, if, if we then, okay. and then the next thing Chomsky said was, well, we all know S rewrites as NPVP. This was the 70s, right, long time ago. And then he said, so that's sort of the start rule of our grammar. And then we have some, uh, some basic uh, conventions about how rules of grammar will be interpreted, and those are what have become expert conventions. So basically we say, if we've got some phrase, then that phrase should have a specifier, could have a specifier and a bar level, and if we've got a bar level, then we've got a head and a complement. I mean, I'm updating expert theory here, this wasn't quite the expert theory that uh, Chomsky had, uh, but something like this. So this gave you what we talked about in the first day, right? universal endocentricity. All phrases are headed, except the start rule of the grammar, actually. And then, of course, later on, since we're doing history, later on this became, essentially, TP consists of a subject and a T-bar, etc. So then this is folded into here. But that was later. At this time, Chomsky said this, and then, so basically, we take this NP, we stick it in here, we get NP rewrites as stress bar N-bar, N-bar rewrites as N-ZP, Right? And if you choose the kid here, right, at the end of this, then this is going to be the kid, but it's going to be an N, right, and it's going to have an S here. Right? So we're going to have the kid, which is an N, because of the, because of the way we've done this, and then we're going to have an S here, so that ends up being spelled out as decision that John was having. Right? If we go the other way around, we take the VP one, then VP will go to VP goes to specifier V bar, V bar goes to V Z, Z P. If we take the root the kid, we put it in here, then this is going to be the kid, and it's going to be a V this time. It's still going to take an S here, so we get the sign that he is having. Okay? So the way the system worked then is strikingly modern in some ways, right? It says that there's a root in the lexicon and that root doesn't have any category, in the syntax it effectively gets a category, right? And then what we do is we build our syntax and then we insert the vocabulary items that are relevant to that syntax. I'm now being a little bit anachronistic, but anyway, more or less, it's, it's very similar to what we do these days. Okay, so that's, um, that's what we had. Now, if you have this, then what that predicts, crucially, is an incredibly strict parallelism between the structure of the VP and the structure of the NP, right? Because the structure better be the same, right? We either put V in here or we put N in here, various other things, right? 
So the structure of the NP is going to be the same as the structure of the VP. But everyone thought at the time that verb phrases had objects, right? So, you know, decide, um, let's not use decide because it's an S object, but like kick the chair, right? The chair is the object of kick, right? That will mean that nouns, the nouns better also have objects, right? Because nouns, because of this theory, are parallel to verbs. Verbs, yeah, we know have objects. It follows that nouns have objects. And therefore, it follows that what everyone thought up to that point, which was that normalizations, for example, uh, were derived from verbs, right? or that bare nominals didn't have objects, right? Because, I mean, it looks like bare nominals don't have objects, right? You know, you're saying the edge, the table, right? I mean, on the face of it, it looks like bare nominals don't have objects. But what this theory forces us into is the decision that bare nominals effectively do have objects. <laughs> so Chomsky gave a huge pile of examples, um, and they're things like six, right? Uh, the weather in England, the weather in 1965, the story of Bill's exploits, the bottom of the barrel. I gave the whole lot of them in my book, so you can actually have a look at them, right? The coastline of Panama, the colour of the wall, and so on. And he said, these really don't look like the prepositional phrase after the noun is derived from a relative clause. So, the weather in England does not mean the same thing as the weather that is in England. Right? It means something like English weather. The weather, it's characteristic of England. Okay. Uh, or the bottom of the barrel certainly doesn't mean the bottom which is of the barrel, which isn't even grammatical in English, right? So it follows then from uh, remarks and normalization that effectively we have, in the same way as we have V, N, P, way back that when, then as sisters, that we're going to have N and then effectively N, P as well. Also, this always ends up surfacing with P, P in English. For independent reasons, so actually we had another transformation that came in and inserted the of. Okay. So that's where remarks and normalization took us to, and that's why we get Radford. Right? That's why we get student of physics type stuff, because where students here and all physics is here, it's because of remarks and normalization. Okay. So along with this syntactic story, there also came a very compelling, the syntactic story is quite compelling, right? Along, along with the syntactic story, there also came a semantic story, okay? And the semantic story really came from Jack and Dock's work, initially, but then also was extended by the Montecovian grammarians. So I'll give you a little quote in the handout there. Um, on, by the way, the handout we're on is relationality eight in the head. Right? You guys know the, the famous Putnam paper? There's a famous paper by uh, Hilary Putnam, a philosophy of language paper, which is meaning eight in the head. So, relationality eight in the head. So, what Jackendorf uh, says here is the following. I'll just read it out to you. If you classify compliments, and by compliments, all he means is compliments in the sense of expert theory, which way back then was things after the head. That's what it meant then. That's when order was still part of the phrase structure system. Remember, we talked about that in the first lecture. Um, so, if you classify compliments as semantic grounds, we find there are three distinct ways in which a compliment may be integrated into semantic interpretation as a functional argument, and what he means there is as an argument, as a restrictive modifier, and as a non restrictive modifier. Let us begin with functional arguments. Those lexical items, now here's the crucial bit, which, which strictly subcategorize phrases in their environment, right? So that would be like the, the SID. Strictly subcategorizing for an S, okay. can be thought of as semantic functions which take as their arguments, right, their semantic arguments, the interpretations of the strictly subcategorized phrases. Okay. For example, the verb give strictly subcategorizes a subject, an object, and an indirect object, and can be thought of as a semantic function f of x, y, z, which maps ordered triples of terms, right, you know. The book, John, the table. The book, John, Mary. Right? Uh, so, which maps ordered triples of terms, that is, individuals, into propositions. Okay, so we're going to see how that semantics is meant to follow there. And then, so that's what he said for verbs, and everyone more or less agrees with that. Well, did then. And then um, for nouns, 
He says, similarly, the nine parts, and then just seek a little of in brackets, strictly subcategorizes an NP and can be treated semantically as a function g of x, which maps terms into terms. Right? So part applies to whiteboard to give us part of the whiteboard. Right? This is a thing. Part then it takes that thing as its input and gives you back, say, that bit or that bit. Right? Okay. So that's the way the semantics works. Um, and you can sort of see how that goes all along very neatly with the syntax, right? The, the Chomsky proposed. And that view is basically the standard view, right? So um, Alexi Anu it all in their enormous uh, book on nine phrases and gender grammar give the trees, or they might be, don't give the trees, but they give structures which uh, make, which look like seven, right? So have a look at the TP on the right first. So we often plan for peace, right? Plan is a two-place predicate, okay? It takes for peace as its complement, and then the other argument is given by the little z. It can be modified by something like often, and then the subject of little z raises up spec TP, as we're all very familiar with. Exactly the same for something like the nominal, our latest prospects for peace, okay? Where prospects is a two-place predicate, takes the PP for peace as its complement, its subject is introduced by a little n, which is our, the whole thing can be modified by an adjective phrase, and then our raises out of the little NP into the case position, which is DP, spec DP. Okay? So you can see how the standard view is that effectively nouns and verbs are parallel in their structure. They're also parallel in their semantic interpretations. So, um, uh, if you have a look at eight, right? a verb like run, an intransitive verb like run, is taken to have the interpretation given there in 8a. It's a set of running things. Right? Uh, uh, a sortal noun, we use the word sortal to mean it's a noun with no arguments, right? So, a sortal noun, like cat, is taken to be a set of cats, a yeah, function from things into cats. Uh, Similarly, with uh, two-place verbs like paint, we have lambda x, lambda y, x paints y, or y paints x, actually. So we have two arguments for paint, picture, two arguments for picture. Right? So that's going to be 9D. And finally, give, three-place predicate, gift, three-place predicate. So the standard view, until we started doing event semantics anyway, was that these, again, are not only parallel in their syntax, they're parallel in their semantics. And as you probably know, there was many more arguments given for that parallelism by people like Tabney's dissertation and by Anna Savalchi in a bunch of her papers. Okay, so I'm going to say that's all wrong. Um, and uh, that we shouldn't be teaching our, well, I don't know if we shouldn't be teaching our first year this, but, uh, but I'm going to say that, that doesn't, that's not right. So the big, I mean, we've always known that even though nouns and verbs look broadly parallel, that there are some real differences in especially how their arguments are interpreted. Okay? And one of the, or, or, or their arguments work syntactically, actually. And one of the uh, important things about, um, about this is the following generalization. Um, actually, skip Ryan, and I'll tell you the generalization first, and then I'll give you the, uh, give you the data. So the generalization I've called Ogre. Okay? It's in 17. Ogre, yeah, big evil giant. Huh? Uh, I like to give my generalizations pronounceable names. So ogre is the optionality generalization for relational expressions. Right? And it says, across languages, <coughs> relational nominals systematically take their apparent arguments optionally in contrast to verbs which vary idiosyncratically in whether any particular argument is optional or not. That is, the verb governs the optionality of its argument. Okay? Whereas nouns, I'm going to argue, systematically take their uh, arguments as optional. Okay? So this has been noticed before, um, but not been really explained, I don't think. So um, Higginbotham and Zubazaretta uh, discussed this, and Grimshaw has some discussion of it in her work as well. Um, so, I mean, it's surprising, actually, that in the standard view, that nouns can take their arguments optionally, right? Because in the standard view, 
arguments are subject to the thief criterion. The thief criterion says, when there's an argument in a predicate, there better be a DP. Right? That's the thief criterion. To assign the thief rule that that we took. That's exactly what the thief criterion says. It says there's a one-to-one -one mapping between arguments of predicates semantically and DPs in the syntax. So if nouns are just like predicates, which is the standard view, and moreover at the have the same phrase structural syntax as verbal predicates do, then it's really quite a surprise that ogre should hold. Right? Now, maybe ogre doesn't hold. I've just told you it, I'm not giving you any real evidence for it. So let's have a let's have a look and see if this is true. So let's first of all look at verbs. So with verbs we know that uh, the individual verbs govern the obligatoriness of the complement. So for example, like a causative verb like kill or chop, right, require complements. So 11a, Lily killed the mouse, and Anson, 11b, Anson chopped the onions. You can't say Lily killed, and you can't say Anson chopped, okay? Well, that's not quite true. Actually, there are certain kinds of processes which allow you to do that, but they're very restrictive. So, for example, generics. If you have a generic subject, you get to be able to drop the object. So you can say things like, tigers only kill at night. Or, the chef in training, well, this isn't generic, this is an iter iterative aspect of construction. The chef in training chopped and diced all night. Okay? So, in certain kinds of conditions, you do get to drop these, right? I'm not going to give you an analysis of what those conditions are, but they're restricted. So, generics, iterative, a very few, very few range you can do this in, right? And uh, you know, even then, you can drop the object, right? But uh, the object can't be specific, right? So, you, so for example, when it comes to tasty ducks, tigers love to kill, right? There we've got generic tigers love to kill, but you still can't miss out the object there, right? So that is when you've given, you know, when you've put in a thing ducks in this case, the species ducks, then, then you can't drop the object, even in the generic case, right? Because the context kind of forces you to be specific. When you're specific, you don't get to drop the object. Or they always buy expensive things and then give away. Right? We've got always in there, makes a, a, a generic kind of sentence, universal kind of sentence. We still can't drop, we still can't drop it then. So, you know, I mean, the, the, the lesson to draw from this is that verbs really do govern their arguments idiosyncratically, right? Whether the arguments are present or not. There are general processes which then allow you to omit certain arguments in certain kinds of semantic and syntactic conditions, but generally, uh, the, well, the generalization holds that verbs idiosyncratically govern their arguments, okay? You probably didn't need to be convinced of that because you probably know it or teach it, but I, th I think it's important to kind of go through these things. Now, let's look at the relational nominal. So I've given you some more in here in 14. So uh, a chapter of that book, your chapter from the book, right? Your part of that book, right? Your two place predicate standard. Right? Coastline of Panama, edge of the table, color of the wall, size of the garden, king of the country, the assistant pro vice chancellor of the university. So these can be fairly complex, these relational nominals, right? Um, and then we have kinship nominal. Uh, we have, so we have kinship nominals like mother of Sue, uh, uncle of John, and we have representational ones like photo of Lily or statue of Anson. Okay, so um, there's a there's an idea that goes around, and I don't know where it comes from, apart from I think it may be connected to the feature criterion, which says something like entailment of the, of an argument. Right, if a predicate entails an argument, right then that predicate implies the syntactic presence of the argument. Of course, the theta criterion doesn't quite say that. The theta criterion says, hypothesize a certain number of theta rules in, a, in an argument. Don't worry about the entailments, just decide what they are, right? And then those will map onto uh, syntax. But the semantics seem to generalize this. So, um, so for example, uh, in, in much of the um, argumentation you see on relational nominals, people say things like, well, when you say, you know, I read a chapter, that entails that in the LF, right, the, log the, the syntactic representation of the logical form of I read a chapter, 
there is a variable for what the things are chapter of. Right? Okay. Um, now, notice though that um, with all of these examples in 14a to l, you can just drop the important complement. So a chapter, the coastline, an edge, the color, and so on. Right? So whereas with verbs we we have idiosyncratic government of the presence or absence of the argument of the complement, with all of these nouns, right, then you can you can you can just leave them out. Right. So this is this then is the base, uh, the basic motivation for 17, this optionality generalization. Okay. Now there are some apparent counterexamples to ogre. Okay. So there are two that are most important. The first one I think we can dismiss quite quickly. So the first one is things like for the sake, or he's a spitting image, or I was pleased to I was pleased to meet the highness, or they did that in the interests. Right? These are all ungrammatical in English, right? But actually all of these appear to be idioms. They don't appear to be just normal nouns. So for example, you can't say something like 19A for the important sake of John. Right? That is, these are fixed expressions. If they're fixed expressions, then obviously you can't leave out the bit of the expression you just fixed. Right? So these aren't normal nouns, right? These are special idiomatic nouns. So there, it's true there are exceptions, but we know idioms, the whole point of idioms is that idioms are exceptions, right? So the actual argument, I mean, the actual argument uh, for, the, for ogre doesn't, is not intended to hold idioms in the same way as many other syntactic requirements don't hold idioms, okay? Um, what about, uh, remember you guys are allowed to interrupt me. There's been like no interruptions yet. <laughs> when I did the theory bits, you guys were interrupting every four seconds, right? But, okay. Um, okay, kinship nouns appear to be another um, another problem for ogre. Uh, well, not another problem since since uh, examples like eighteen are not really a problem, but they appear to be a problem. So, for example, it's fine to say something like "my uncle fell down the stairs," where "my" is obviously going to be the argument of uncle, right? And it's fine to say something like "the uncle of the queen fell down the stairs," right? Where we have the complement. But it is a bit weird in English to say, an uncle fell down the stairs. Right? Or the uncle fell down the stairs. Then so, my mother fell down the stairs, the mother of the queen fell down the stairs, but a mother fell down the stairs, or the mother fell down the stairs. I mean, I don't, you know, I've, I've thought about these so many times, they just seem perfect to me now. But, <laughs> but, uh, for most native speakers of English, I don't know what, how it works in Korean, um, at least kinship nouns, they seem harder to use without their argument than, for example, nouns like chapter or edge or color or photo or, or statue or something like that. Right? So the kinship ones seem special. So we might so yeah. How about generic mothers? Mothers. Mothers shouldn't smoke, that kind of thing. Uncles should always remember their birthdays. <coughs> yeah. So yeah. But, but, I mean, so they, they, so is your point yeah. going to be, well, they appear to work the same as the verbs? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, have a look at 24 and 25. <laughs> I have another question. But let, let me do this one first. 24 and 25, an uncle should always remember birthdays, or a mother should never smoke. Those are generic kind of things. And again, you seem to be able to drop them in that case, right? So they do look a little bit like that. Okay. Yeah. How about just dropping all or all? So in your example, like 20C, instead of 20C, you have the or on uncle. Why can you say just an uncle? Just uncle. Uncle? Yeah. On its own? No. No. Ungrammatical. How yeah. about discourse bound? Like suppose we're talking about somebody's uncle or some uncles, and then can you just say the uncle that we talked about? That is example 28. Oh. <laughs> you guys are doing great questions because you're obviously, you know, thinking along the same lines as I was thinking. Very good point. We'll come to that just one, in, in just one second, right? So, uh, to c cover now the two points that have just been raised from the audience. Um, so, uh, it turns out that, well, before, before I get there, notice that 22 and 23 contrast, right, with 20 and 21. So, my uncle fell down the stairs, the uncle of the queen fell down the stairs, weird, an uncle fell down the stairs, or the uncle fell down the stairs. Compare that to the table's edge was rough, the edge of the table was rough, the edge was rough, 
they're absolute, you know, they're, it's unexceptionable. So there is a contrast between 20C and 22C and so on. So, as you just pointed out, um, this is reminiscent with what happens with trans transitive verbs because the effect appears to be mitigated in generic uh, contexts. So, an uncle should always remember birthdays or a mother should never smoke. Okay. Um, so, you might say, and I think this is where you're going, uh, oh, maybe kinship nouns are really like transitive verbs. Okay. Well, one possible counter to that might be the examples in 26 and 27, which are perfect. So, I'm now an uncle. She's a mother, I have a mother, and I want a brother. I don't think those are really counterexamples to the proposal. I just put them in there just in case anyone thought about them. They're not counterexamples because, you know, in 26, I'm an uncle or she's a mother. Well, clearly I and she are the arguments of uncle and mother, right? So the arguments are present even if they don't appear as an all three. And in 27 A and B, I have a mother or I want a brother. Well, there's been a lot of argumentation in the literature which says something like have really takes a predicate phrase as its complement. So something like I have a mother means something like there is a mother at me. Right? That's the Canadian analysis of have, in which case me would then be in some kind of sense a uh, complement of mother. Right? Heidi Harley has an, art, has an analysis of want, which goes along the same lines. So, you know, I mean, these aren't very, I mean, so th this is a possible counter-argument to the claim that kinship nouns are like transitive verbs. I'm saying that maybe that does count as a counter-argument, but it's not the strongest counter-argument because there are counter-arguments. Counter right? Um, however, what seems to be different from what happens with transitive verbs, so this is the point that uh, um, was just made here, is that, interestingly, you can miss out the apparent argument if you modify the head noun with a rich enough modificational structure. And we'll see that really means that what you're doing is you're enriching the context enough. Right? So the uncle I was telling you about fell down the stairs is, again, absolutely perfect. Right? Or the brother you already met turned up late to the disco. Or or even something like a young mother was attacked at the disco, right? Where we've just got young there. Right? Um, so all of these things seem to, it seems to be possible that actually what you, you know, you get to not put in the apparent argument of these nouns, that is you get to violate the teeth criterion when the discourse is kind of okay. Not when you're in, gen I mean, true when you're in generic context and so on, but it's even more than what happens with verbs, right? If you compare that to uh, you know, when it comes to tasty ducks, tigers always love to kill, which is terrible, right? So we've just created a discourse context, you can't leave out the argument. But in this case, when you create a rich enough discourse context, you can. So, for example, look at 32 now. Lola's uncle and her cousin are visiting next week. The uncle smokes like a trooper, so I don't know which bedroom to put him in. Luckily, the cousin is very laid back. Right? So again, we've, we've got a rich enough discourse context there that we don't actually need somehow to put in the argument. But that suggests that the arguments don't really exist as part of the LF representation. Right? They're not actually there in the LF. What, they're, what you're doing is instead you're saying that kinship nouns bear some kind of feature which requires the referent of that noun to be identifiable within the discourse. One way of doing that is well, setting up a discourse referent for them, like that's in 32. Another way of doing it is restricting the noun phrase so much that you create the presupposition that your hearer is going, oh, there must be a strong enough discourse context to license this. Okay? Um, so that's what I think is going on with kinship nouns. They don't have arguments. Rather, they bear a pragmatic requirement that they're identifiable. And in some languages, you know, you can even use them, in some languages not, which don't normally allow bare nouns, you can use these things, in fact, even in English, right? You know, grandma turned up late yesterday, right? You can turn them into, essentially, you know, referential expressions with, you know, you don't say my grandma, just grandma turned up lately, right? And uh, that's because everyone knows who you're talking about, right? So that is, the referent of grandma is absolutely immediately identifiable. You don't even need a the there in that case. Right? 
So there's something special about kinship nouns, absolutely. But the special thing about kinship nouns is not that they require an argument. What the argument does is it performs the same function as, for example, a modifier. What the argument does is it makes the referent identifiable. It makes the referent of mother identifiable as my mother. Right? So that's what's going on with kinship nouns. Okay? Yeah? yeah. The, you know, the identifier or put the discourse context this in syntax is uh, is out, but it's uh, uh, repaired by the no other way around. <laughs> other way around. So the question is, uh, um, is this somehow out in the syntax to say the mother? Well, that is that out in syntax and repaired by discourse. No, uh, this is perfect in syntax and made a bit weird by discourse unless you fix the discourse, right? So there's a feature in here which says, identify me. Right? Make sure I'm identifiable in the discourse. That's what that feature says, right? It's a little bit like kind of definiteness, okay? So it's like kinship nouns come along with their own definiteness requirement. And so if you don't identify it in the discourse, you get pragmatic weirdness, but syntactically it's perfect. Perfect syntactically. Right? This isn't a feature that needs checked or anything, it's just a feature that says, I can only be used in certain kinds of discourses where my reference is identifiable. Right? Probably, Much uh, like, you know, uh, a pronoun. It's probably I, I misunderstood about the, the possessive. You, you're describing uh, possessive as an argument, right? So that this one does not have a possessive. Possessive actually, uh, uh, LLF, possessive, uh, Possessive is, uh, possessive is interpreted as an argument of the kinship uh, now, right? Well, I, I mean, that's the standard view. I'm going to argue it's not. The standard view is that these, that these kinship nouns, or all these nouns, have arguments, right? And I'm going to say that they don't have arguments, right? So all I'm doing for you now, right now, is saying, OK, let's buy the idea that they have arguments for a bit. But if, and if we do that, then it turns out there's a mystery which is why those arguments escape the clutches of the teacher criteria. That is why they can be optional. So what I'm doing is sort of saying to you, actually, you know, there's a systematic difference between verbs and these nouns. And the explanation is going to be that these nouns never have arguments. Right? So, uh, so this is perfect syntactically. The mother fell down, or the uncle came down the stairs, or whatever. Perfect syntactically. Right? It's just that the feature that requires pragmatic identification on the kinship noun, it, well, better be pragmatically identified. So that's a little bit like pronouns. He. You don't get to just say, he's happy. You better identify he. Right? So this is a feature that we know and love. I don't want to call it, but it's a feature, you know, it's the feature that says, make sure I'm identified. And it seems to be a very, very basic feature of kinship nouns in general. So you look across languages of the world, kinship, that class, semantic class, seems to, I mean, seems to have this requirement. So it's probably a UG requirement. Um, okay, so uh, explanations of this, of this effect, ogre effect, it's been noticed before, obviously. So explanations of this uh, effect have been given under the normal assumption that relational nouns are relations. See, I'm going to say that relational nouns are not relations. So that, you know, something like chapter or part or mother, that doesn't mean lambda x, lambda y, mother x, y. That just means lambda x, mother x. This thing's a mother. This thing's an edge. Right? So uh, that's what I'm going to end up saying, but that's not the normal thing. Normally what people say is that these are relational. And so, for example, in th this is Barker's analysis in 33 and 34, Uncle is given the analysis, lambda x, lambda y, x is an uncle is y. Right? So it's got two arguments. Okay? As opposed to sortal nouns like human or cloud. Cloud is a good one. Cloud is just lambda x, x is a cloud. Okay? Clouds don't have an argument. Okay. So uh, just the cloud is in the sky. So the point about cloud is that it doesn't have any arguments, 
right? It's just a, it's a, it's a sim, I mean, this is the standard view. It's a one place predicate, like cat, okay? And it doesn't have any arguments. Uh, compare that to edge or uncle. Edge has arguments. That is the edge of the table or the uncle of David. And so they're different. So this is the standard view that I just talked about already. So what do people do to deal with the fact that sometimes you don't need to say the edge of x, you can just say the edge, right? So what Barker does is he does this the uh, semantic type function shifter thing, which is in 37x, okay? How, how, do you care about the, the lambda stuff? Shall I, shall I run through this with you? Yeah, it's not that hard. So what x does, <coughs> is it says, listen, I'm going to look for something which is relational nominal, right? And then I'm going to kick back something which is going to be a, pre a normal predicate. And what it's going to do is it's going to bind off one of the arguments of the relational nominal, right? So it will no longer be needed in the syntax. Uh, and uh, that's what I'm going to do. So this says, I'm looking for a relational nominal. And I'm going to kick back something which is just a predicate, like the x, predicate things, right? Uh, and that predicate is going to say there is some y such that x bears a relevant relation to y. With me? Yeah? Okay. So let's take, for example, edge, right? So edge is lambda x, lambda y, edge is the x of y, okay? We apply our little thing 37 here to edge, okay? And what that kicks, so edge effectively plugs in there, yeah? Which means it also plugs in there. Okay. And then what we get out of is this, with edge plugged in. So we get lambda x, there exists a y, edge x, y. Right? I haven't done all the lambda conversions for you, but those of you that know how to do it, can do it with your heads, and the rest of you don't need to care. Okay, so with this in place, right, this now turns effectively into a normal predicate, right? So this looks just like cat or cloud, right? Lambda x and then, and then the predicate of that x, right? Which is there exists a y such that x has y to match. Yeah. So if you look at something like the edge was rough, then the derivation is there in 40. Basically, you've got credit rough, you've got your complicated thing edge, you stick this x onto it. Right? So you get the x edge, which gives you something like the x, such that there is some y, such that x is an edge of y, and then you stick, you give that as a predicate for rough, so you get the edge is rough, meaning the x, such that there's some y which the x is the edge of, right, is rough. Okay? So we get, to, so we get the thing that's rough is the edge, and there's something or other which it's the edge of. Okay? So that, that's, that's, that's how Barker deals with this effect. What he says then is that you can get round the problem of the thief criterion by sticking in this little thing x here, and what this little thing x does is it kind of knocks off one of the arguments, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay? All right, now, um, in addition to uh, this, um, he also needs to deal with cases where sortal nouns look like they have an argument. So this goes back to your question about possessives, right? So it's true that the cloud of David is a bit odd. I'm going to come back to it in a second, actually. Whereas David's cloud in English is fine, right? David's cloud means, you know, we're all lying in the grass, it's a lovely sunny day, uh, and a couple of clouds scud across the sky, one of them looks, you know, and you're racing with your friend who's lying in the grass, and you're like, okay, you take that cloud, I'll take that cloud, the first one for the cloud to hit the sun wins, right? Everyone's done that, right? Yeah. Uh, so you can give a beer by your side, uh, and then you can say David's cloud won, right? So, so in order to deal with these kinds of examples, what Barker does is he has another one of these type shifters, right? I'll write it up at the top now, and he calls that one pi for possessive, effectively. Okay? And what that looks like is lambda p, I'm looking for some predicate, not a relational lambda, just a predicate, and I'm going to kick back 
a relation, lambda x, lambda y, right, such that y is p, okay, and the relation holds between x and y. So, just running through that again, so what this does is this can take something like cloud, right, so cloud will stick in here, which means it also gets stuck in here. And what we get out then is a relation, right? Lambda x, lambda y, such that y is cloud, right? And x has some relation to y. Okay? So then we give, we give it David, and then we get something like lambda y, y is a cloud, and David has some relation to y. And then pragmatically, we will figure out what the relation is. In this case, it's you know, cloud that one has chosen in game when one is lying in the grass in the park. Right? So it's just some pragmatically relevant relation. So, you know, this pi here is used to deal with these little possessive s's. And then this x here is used to deal with these cases where you don't have, you don't have an argument for something that's relational now. That's part of your system, right? And you might be a little bit worried about the system, right? Because actually you notice that what allows you to do is randomly remove arguments and randomly add arguments. Right? So actually, it's a very, very powerful system um, that says, yeah, well, we'll see what it does in a second. Okay, now, I think there are four problems with this kind of approach. Um, someone keep an eye on the time for me, will you? Five minutes. Oh my god, really? I just talk too slowly. Okay, let me give you uh, a bunch of, um, of examples which are relevant to this. So it turns out, right, that actually, I said to you, I wrote down the cloud of David, and I said, oh, that's a bit weird. But actually, it turns out that all of these relational nouns, sorry, all of these sort of nouns, right, can have complements. Right, and actually, it turns out that the complements they, they can have are the same semantically as the complements of the real relational nouns. They fall into the same semantic classes. Right? That's puzzling in a Barker view. Because that means, if it's really true, that means that basically all, all sort of nouns need to also be relational nouns. Right? That is, every sort of noun also needs to be a relational noun. Right? But that's not what he says, right? I mean, the theory says, no, we've got sort of nouns and relational nouns. If you make all sort of nouns relational nouns, well, they also have to be sort of nouns as well. Right? So there's no way to do that in the system. The only way to do it would be to add in, right, by using this pi thing, you could add in uh, you know, extra arguments for sort of nouns. If you do that, there are two problems. One is that this pi is only meant to connect with this apostrophe s. Right? Otherwise, the cloud of David should mean David's cloud. And we'll see in a second, it doesn't. And the second weird, the second thing is that, well, this R is very, very general, but it turns out that when you say things like the cloud of David, actually there's only a very small set of relations that this can be. This cannot be resolved to any old pragmatic relation. This has to be resolved to the particular semantic relations you find with relational nouns. So I'll show you that just now before we before we break. So if you have a look at part four. A single cloud of the weather front drifted into view. There we have cloud with of the weather front. Cloud there is part of the weather front, right? A squirrel of the Sturus genus lives in my holly tree. There again we've got squirrel as part of a larger species. Okay. The glamour of the occasion surprised me. The awkwardness of the example was striking. These are completely normal. Uh, where in this case we're saying the glamour that was characterized in the occasion, or the awkwardness that characterizes the example. So we have these, that's like a little bit like the weather in England cases, where we have, you know, it's the English weather. This is the glamorous occasion. Uh, here's some cases where we have roles. So just like the king of England, we can say, we can make wizard. Now, wizard is a pretty normal sort of noun. You can immediately make it into a relational noun by saying something like, the grand high wizard of Oz will see you now. Even things like uh, um, teacup, you can say, so, actually, uh, this happened to me. We're in Buckingham Palace with some friend of mine. Uh, we're in the gift shop, and uh, he was looking for something to buy for his mother. 
and there was a teacup of the queen, right? And, he's, and, I, and he said, what about this? And I said, no, that teacup of the queen is just too tacky to buy, right? And it's perfectly fine. It just means a teacup which represents the queen, right? So that means that teacup has to be a relational noun. Right? Um, and then these are some examples from Google, um, using cloud again. So this video shows the reconstructed volume density of a 3D point cloud of a face, right? Or it was a cloud of a face. Those are both Google examples. And then also, with kinship, it's harder, right? Because kinship nouns is only a small group of them, right? But actually, when one makes up a new kinship noun, it follows the syntax and of, rela of relational nouns in general, right? So if you, if you adopt something which is not kinship noun, and you turn it into a kinship noun, then it will end up, well, you turn it in, you put all phrase after it, then it can behave as a kinship noun. So a good example of this is, has anyone here read Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials trilogy? No? It's a trilogy of children's books, which uh, is absolutely brilliant, really great. Um, and in this, in this uh, sort of fancy world that, that uh, Pullman puts together, each person has a sort of externalized soul that it takes the shape of an animal, right? And they're called demons, right? So he's taken the word demon, right, and turned it into a kinship noun, effectively, because each person has this kin, this thing that's deeply related to it. So the moment you do that, if you look at these are examples from Google again, you get things like the demon of Pullman's protagonist, right? Or sitting on the roofs of Oxford, she sees a bird, the demon of a witch. Okay? So what we see in all of these cases is that apparent sortal nouns, which are one place predicates, can always be used as though they're relational nouns, right? Which is really hard to deal with in this system. This system says that sorrowful nouns are one-place predicates and relational nouns are two-place predicates. Right? The only way to make one-place predicates into two-place predicates is to introduce this extra R relation. But what we see that's really crucial here in all of these examples is that the kinds of relation that we get when, when you give a syntax to the PP after these things is a relation that is already in existence for relational law. It's not a general pragmatic relation. It's an actual. It's one of the relations we see with relational nouns. So it turns out, I think that you know, the only way to deal with this in uh, in the Barker kind of style of system, well, there isn't any, there isn't actually any way to deal with it. It's satisfying. Okay. All right. So I'll give you some a couple of other examples. Uh, but I guess we want to break now, um, and then we'll finish off nouns after the break. Okay. Thank you.